Can you hear in the back? All right. All right. Hello? Hello? Can you hear that? All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexi Kramer from the Reliance of Scala, and this is our first time at Inkling. So, Robert uh, made this all happen. This is awesome. It's actually a beautiful location, right in the middle of everything. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Uh, and the topic today is Scala Z. Just a few words how this all happened. So, Alan presented at the first uh, Silicon Valley Scala Symposium with the talk on the civil graph. So, that's actually his area of uh, research and, and, and work. And uh, it, it caused a lot of interest, uh, but people were asking for Scala Z. People were asking, like, do we have a talk on Scala Z? And we didn't have a talk on specific on Scala Z. So Alan said, you know, I can give a talk on Scala Z. And of course, you know, his distributed graph talk was full, so we knew there's a lot of interest. But we, you know, we just decided once he's still here, we'll do a special meetup on this, right? Because there is really a lot of interest in, in Scala Z, uh, and uh, we're very happy to uh, to have Alan. He I mean, his conference talk was amazing, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, but before that, uh, Robert will say a few words about <laughs> our venue, uh, then a little bit of your announcements, uh, and then we'll, we'll go into the talk. So now, Robert. Uh, thanks, Alexi. Uh, just want to say hello and uh, welcome to everyone. It's uh, great to see everyone here uh, learning about Scala Z. I uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm Robert Scott. I uh, run the uh, platform engineering team here at Inkling. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Inkling and kind of give you a brief introduction on kind of the, where you are and kind of the stuff that we do here. Um, so when we started Inkling four years ago, uh, we realized that uh, we had to develop entirely new processes for the publishing industry. Uh, so that's kind of a polite way of saying that publishers didn't really have a, a clue about what they were doing. Um, so when we thought about this as engineers, uh, we realized that a lot of the processes that we use as engineers can be applied to developing content. Uh, so the TLDR, if you're going to kind of tune out and start checking the email, is that uh, we take uh, source, con we treat content like source control and apply software processes to content uh, from an engineering perspective. Um, so I guess to give you kind of a quick walkthrough of how publishing traditionally uh, works, you know, publishers work with vendors in India to develop content, to work on the layout. And so they would actually take the vendors in India would take a book, take a PDF version of it, put it into a FedEx box, ship it all the way to New York, and editor in New York would read the book, mark it up, make modifications, then ship that PDF, all the, or ship the paper version all the way back to India. They'd incorporate the changes, and then they'd kind of do that over and over again. Uh, actually, can anyone here in the back? Yeah? All right. Um, and so we looked at the process, and we're like, this whole FedEx thing is kind of crazy. I mean, shipping things across the world is out of control. Um, but in reality, it's also very similar to how software engineering processes work with uh, QA organizations, where you have one organization developing the software, and then you have another organization kind of re reviewing and improving the, the, the code in the process. Um, so we took that, and we applied version control uh, to have a you know, single repository where we want to store the, the software. Then we added issue tracking and stuff like that to have uh, a repository of how issues are working and what's going on, and we ended up with a fairly streamlined process for developing content digitally where you have got a people in various places. Um, so we've actually been using a lot of Scala. Uh, we started using Scala about two and a half years ago on uh, our content uh, compiler. Um, so one of the things, you know, like you use a Scala compiler like Scala C, we have a compiler for our content uh, to translate a lot of things into uh, the final version. And uh, we've been using Scala ever since on a lot of different projects. So uh, if you are interested in finding out more, um, we'll be giving some kind of Q&A and demo sessions after the, the talk. Um, and so come either find me or anyone who's wearing some new brand new gear, and we'd be happy to kind of uh, tell you more about what's going on here. Uh, so thanks again, and welcome, and I'll uh, hand it back to Alexis. Thanks, Robert. So a couple announcements. We have actually a very cool month of September. It just happened this way. So Alan is living back to uh, Santa Barbara. So we have to have him here before that. Uh, September 12th is uh, actually we have an amazing panel. We have the panel of Rod Johnson, who did a keynote uh, at Scala Days, proposing that we simplify Scala kind of, uh, for adoption in the world. And we're going to have, I think, an amazing panel uh, of Rod Johnson versus a bunch of functional programmers. 
uh, which will be full, which will be in Kabam, uh, another Twitter office, uh, Paul Sanford. Uh, and uh, September 26th, we have the original author of the IntelliJ Idea Scala plugin, Alexander Pathaluzin. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, he comes all the way from St. Petersburg, you know, to Jow 1, and he, he does two talks. He does a Scala Bay talk on September 19th. Vlad will confirm, right? Vlad? Vlad? 19th, right? Uh, September 19th is uh, Alexander. 19th. 19th. Yeah, so he's talking in Salo Bay uh, and, uh, on the 19th, and on the 26th of September, he's doing the same talk at Identify, uh, which is uh, in Salo. So, these th things are pretty cool right now, but we'll see you know, a lot of flux uh, in the waiting list, so if you want to, to join, you didn't get uh, with us all. Uh, and uh, I think some folks may have other announcements. Uh, ML Jason had some, so uh, we'll just do a few. And uh, the usual topic of hiring and being hired, if you guys are interested, uh, basically just hang out afterwards. Uh, I usually designate some hiring owner, which may be here, right? So, and Jason? Great. Thanks, Alexi. I just had a quick announcement. Uh, work at Netflix down in Los Gatos, and we're looking for Scala developers there. Well, you guys probably know it's hard to find good Scala developers, so I really, you know, there's a lot of companies hiring Scala developers. I think if you want to learn it, if you're still picking it up, you should go for the jobs. Uh, there's a lot of people looking right now, but we're also looking. It's a great company. We're very Java centric, we're very into open source, and a lot of people are really starting to wake up to scholars. So if you're interested, please have a look at the Netflix jobs list. That's it. Any other announcements? I have one. Sure. Uh, just uh, Nick Wall and I are giving a scholar course in San Jose in case anyone's interested at the end of this month and at the beginning of next, last, last week in September. Yeah, so that will be the best way to learn scholar if you haven't been. Yeah. And I guess it will include some scholar tests as well. Right. Okay, cool. So now on to, to the scholar Z. And it's all yours. Oh, I think I have mic. You don't need any more mics. Click to record full screen. Assuming that's recording now. Okay, uh, so today I'm here to talk about uh, the Scala Z. Uh, so the title of the talk is The Warm Fuzzy Scala Library, and a little background about that. Uh, so the term warm fuzzy thing uh, is inspired by Simon Payton Jones of Haskell fame where he said one of the things, uh, one of the mistakes he believed, well, one of the mistakes he believed in Haskell was calling uh, a monad a monad. And he, he believes that monad, uh, the, I guess the essence of a monad isn't really that hard to understand, but a lot of people hear the word monad and they hear it from this abstract field called category theory and they sort of get scared and think it's hard to understand. And so going in with that mentality of uh, thinking that monad is this difficult thing sort of hinders their understanding of it. And so he believes Monad should have maybe been called warm fuzzy thing instead. And so that's sort of uh, the inspiration for the title of this talk. I know when I first uh, started learning Scala, I had heard about the Scala as a library and how a lot of people were complaining about all these symbolic operators, taking implicit conversions to a whole new level, uh, and all these weird names, Monad, Functor. But I think uh, once you begin to understand sort of like what I call like the gateway uh, data structures into Scala Z. Uh, as you become more familiar with them, you'll become curious and, and slowly begin to understand more and more and dive deeper into Scala Z. And definitely, uh, when I first started uh, learning it, that was definitely the case. I started off with like maybe using two or three data structures in there, and I slowly uh, delved more and went deeper into the rabbit hole. So a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I am a fourth year student at UCSB. I go back in about two weeks where I'm studying uh, computer science for both my bachelor's and my master's. I work as a research assistant on campus where the screen freaks out. So uh, I study massive graph mining and modeling. So we take like graphs from say like Facebook or Twitter or any, any online social network and we see what interesting properties we can uh, take out of it. This summer I was working as a, or I am working as an engineering analytics intern at Box. Uh, we do use bits of Scala Z in the back end so we use things like validation, which I'll talk about today. Uh, on the analytics team, I use the Scooby library, which is this sort of Scala abstraction over Hadoop. And Scooby uses Scala Z, and by extension, my code uses a lot of Scala Z. So 
Uh, it's pretty useful. I hope to convince you today that it is a general purpose library and not a purely academic ivory tower and has no use in the real world kind of thing. So this is how I envision uh, how things are going to go down over the next hour or so. There's going to be lots and lots of REPL work and live coding. Uh, that's actually, this is probably like the second to last slide, I believe. The screens keep freaking out. Whoa. OK. Uh, if you want me to try something while I'm coding, feel free to stop me, let me know. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to stop me and let me know. I'm trying to make this informal. It's, I find typically when discussing um, perhaps more advanced topics, it's helpful to, to ask a lot of questions instead of uh, getting lost in the middle and just sort of tuning out at the end. So on the agenda today, th these are my goals. I hope that by the end you guys are familiar with what these things are. Uh, specifically that weird backtick or backslash front and slash thing and validation. And so the general trend is going to be I'm going to implement some form of the data structure myself uh, and sort of walk through what that data structure does and what sort of laws that data structure should hold. And then uh, once that's done, I'm going to show you the Scholarsy equivalent to, uh, to sort of show how you would actually use Scholarsy. Because the whole existence of Scholarsy is so you don't have to implement all these data structures and functions yourself. You should be reusing them. So the main motivation in building them is so uh, we gain an understanding of what each thing does. Quick question, you've the screen before you go, right? Yes. All right, so this is a disclaimer. Uh, I'm learning as well. I didn't really start heavily using Scala Z until around the beginning of this summer. Uh, I guess, quick question, has anyone here used Scala Z or feel com feels comfortable using Scala Z? We got a few people, okay. So if I get questions that I don't know, I may need your guys' help, and I hope you guys can help me. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna do my best today to uh, walk everyone through. Does uh, the smiley face? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try submitting a pull request for that after this and see, see what the folks over there at type level think about that. Okay, so I have uh, two terminal screens. This is a blank project. Can I make this bigger? Uh, way bigger. How's that? Okay. All right, so uh, the first function I always use to sort of motivate uh, type classes and what Scala-Z provides is a sum function. So I'll write like a really sort of naive implementation which will look like this. And what it does is, as you can probably tell, it takes a list of ints, returns to you an int, and the way it's implemented is it just does a simple reduction over the entire list. So clearly, if we wanted to sum a list of ints, this worked, but if we wanted to sum, say, a list of doubles or a list of big ints, the operations would pretty much be exactly the same, save for the type parameter. And so, I, of course, being the good programmers that we are, we want to abstract over this, right? We don't want to write a function, the same function for int double string or, or int double big int or so on. So uh, let's add a type parameter on this. Question. What is that crash if you had when you were I will get to that. <laughs> You're getting a bit ahead, <laughs> yes. So let's pretend that either you don't know that reduce will fail on an empty list or that the list is, has more than two elements in it. So let's parameterize the type with A. And of course, uh, if I try to compile, ooh, what's that thing? Uh, if I try to compile this, it's gonna fail because there's no, there's no plus method on, on uh, any type. So I need to give this a constraint. Thankfully, the Scala standard library has a Scala math numeric, which basically represents, it's a type class that represents anything that is, well, numeric. And to provide default instances for it for what you would believe to be numeric, like int, double, big int, whatever. So the way we're gonna do that is say implicit uh, A, you can only call this if, a, if there's a numeric A in scope, and instead of this plus, it's going to be A dot plus. That should compile. And then, ooh, oh, I see. That should be an A. Okay, so we can call this on list one, two, three. We can just as easily call this on uh, a list of doubles. In fact, 
Excuse me? We should call some. I have to call some. Oh, correct. Yes. <laughs> I do have to call some. This is the downsides of live coding. I will inevitably screw up at several points in the night. In fact, instead of doing compile, let's just do run. Let's see if we can make this bigger as well. Cool, yeah. So it's generic on numeric types now. But if you look at how we've implemented it, we're depending on, uh, so of all the numeric types, of all the operations that numeric provides for us, uh, it gives us uh, minus, negate, plus, times, everything, but we're only ever using plus. And so if you, you can imagine that this same kind of function could apply to, say, a list of strings, in which case you would take the list of strings, take all the strings, and concatenate them together. Or you can take a list of lists and take all the internal lists and just concatenate them, to, uh, concatenate them together. So really this kind of thing would work for anything that supports uh, adding them together or appending them together, I guess. So let's write a different function. Let's call this uh, reduce, for lack of a better word. And so we need, we don't want numeric, right? Because there's no way you're gonna make, you're gonna give a numeric instance for, say, string. So we want a different type class now. And all that type class really, all this function really needs is uh, to be able to take two A's and combine them together to give you another A. And so let's create our own type class. And let's call that, uh, let's say, addable. And then uh, let's do x of a, y of a returns an a. And so you can only call this if you have an addable instance of a. And we are going to go ahead and delegate that to the reduce method on a.add. This, oh wait, that will still work. So let's implement an instance for int. Implicit val uh, int is addable equals new addable int, and this is going to be easy. We have an, oh wait, this will actually still work, but actually we don't care about this anymore. Let's reduce a list of ints, and that should get us, ooh. I implemented, oh, <laughs> of course. List of six, uh, or yeah, the element six, which is what we expected, right? It's, it's basically the same thing, nothing new. But now what we can do is go ahead and do the same thing for, say, string is addable. And we say new addable string. We take two strings. And in fact, concatenation happens to be plus as well, so that's convenient. And so with the same function, we can reduce on a list strings, right? So before when we had the sum function, that would only work on anything that had a type class instance for numeric, but we were only ever using the plus method on numeric, so we can, if we sort of create our own type class that just says, all I want you to do is to be able to add two A's together, uh, we can now just create a function that abstracts on, or that requires an instance of addable, you can take two A's, add them together, I can go ahead and reduce down an entire list of A's for you. Now the downside to this, of course, is uh, if we try to reduce, say, an empty list of ints, what's gonna happen, as he pointed out, is that it's gonna give a runtime error, right? And so the reason this happens is because all you've given uh, reduce is a, essentially a function that knows how to combine two A's, but if your list is empty, uh, it says I have nothing to combine and I have no fallback value. So instead of trying to guess what you wanted me to do, I'm just going ahead and fail and make you fix your mistake. So really what we want to do is uh, say if there are two or more elements in a list, go ahead and reduce them down like you've been doing. Otherwise, uh, you should fall back to a particular zero value. And so an, an alternative way to implement the sum function uh, would be instead of doing a reduce, you can do a full left in which case we pass a zero value uh, to the first parameter and then we pass the binary operation to the second parameter. And so now even if I try to sum a, let's see, even if I try to sum a, let me go ahead and print line, or no, that's not what I wanted. Let's 
Yes, so even if I try to sum an empty list now, an uh, empty list of ints, it's going to return zero because it has this fallback value now, right? The first parameter to fold left is, is the corresponding zero value to whatever uh, numeric type class instance it's picking up. So we want to do something similar to addable, right? Uh, so for, like, going back to the example of strings, we can go ahead and concatenate two strings, but if we say we have an empty list of strings, our fallback value can be just an empty string. It's, it's pretty intuitive. So we're going to have this trait called, let's say, uh, addable with zero. That will extend addable A, and this will include a zero value. And so what this means is if you can give me an addable with zero instance, uh, that means that you're able to give me a zero value and a binary operation. And now, instead of uh, our reduce function, instead of doing list.reduce, which may fail, we're going to go ahead and say list.fold left. We're going to give it the zero value, and we're going to give it the plus value, just like before. And now, if I go back to reducing on the list of empty ints, I made an implicit, oh, correct, yes. All right, let's give this a zero. Uh, let's give this uh, addable with zero. Same for reduce. Same for reduce. Yes, of course. Addable with, with zero. What's happening? Zero, oh, this should be end. I'm having all sorts of, oh, add, all sorts of problems. There you go. OK, so now we're able to go ahead and reduce an empty list of, of ints, simply because for the same reason as with the numeric example, we have now provided a fallback zero value. Uh, so I've been using the terms addable and addable with zero uh, in Scala Z, as I'll show you in a few, in a few moments. Uh, addable is really called semigroup, and addable with zero is really called monoid. And so these names. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Okay, correct. Yeah. So uh, he was pointing out that I was sort of using a wrong term. It's not really a default value. Uh, what fold is going to do is just go ahead and take this zero value and do the binary operation on the zero and the first element if there is one. If there's if the if the list is completely empty, it's just going to give you the zero value. If there's at least one or more, if there's one or more elements, it's going to take the zero, the first element, apply the binary operation, and then. That's your new, I guess, zero value, and then you're just going to go ahead and fold across the entire list. Uh, so yeah, addable with zero is really called monoid in Scala Z. Uh, addable is called semigroup, and so these names are taken from the field of abstract algebra. And basically, the entire idea of that field is instead of uh, is that they're going to describe what a structure can do. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, it probably makes sense to mention that you can make a binary tree addable with zero. Yeah, yeah. So there's certain there are certain laws associated with monoid and semigroup, uh, namely for the the add operation that we've been doing, right? So if you imagine that this says addable, if uh, instead of addable with zero, it says uh, monoid, uh, the add operation, or I believe they call it the append operation, must have the law that uh, so we we have x and y here. Uh, if you have another value z, if you do add of x and y, and you take that result and add it with z, that must have the same result as uh, adding x with the result of adding y and z. So this is, the operation must be associative. And the zero value must have the property that, append, that adding the zero value with x must return x, and adding x with the zero value must return x. And uh, actually, Scala Z has Scala check bindings, which is prop Scala check is this properties-based testing a library in Scala. It has Scala check bindings to say, if you have your own monoid instance, uh, you can run the Scala check bindings on it, and it'll go ahead and generate a bunch of uh, test cases or test input for you to make sure, or as best as it can, to make sure that whatever you're doing is following uh, monoid laws. Excuse me? Associative. Is it commute? Is it commutative? X plus y plus z. X or the property I'm trying to go for is uh, x plus y plus 
z must equal uh, x plus y plus z. Oh, did I say commutative? No, no, I was asking about commutative. Oh. It does not have to be commutative. It just has to be associative. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and now show you the equivalent code in uh, Scala Z. So let's just make something called, uh, I don't know, Scala Z. Package. So I'm going to go ahead and now import uh, scala.z.monoid, which is what we want. In fact, I'm going to try to pull up the Scala doc on monoid. So this is the Scala Z Scala doc. Uh, monoid defines two functions which we are, you should be familiar with. They call it append. You take two values of f, append them together, and you have this uh, zero value. And so here we can just as easily write our uh, reduce function as a. Give me a list of A's constrained by the fact that you must have a monoid of A in scope. And the implementation is simple. Uh, in fact, we might have to, we have to actually do this. Uh, a dot append. So the reason I have to do this explicitly is because you notice here that the second parameter is a, a call by name, I believe. Is a correct term? Is a call by name parameter, and what? So the the, the binary operation takes one that's a uh, call by value and one that's call by name. The uh, the function that full left is expecting is a binary operation that takes two call by names. So uh, to make the types play nice, I have to do this. Oh, did it die again? <laughs> Whoa, now everything died. Yeah, it's just that. Okay. This entire splitting. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me try this. So, okay, so we've imported Scala Z dot monoid. Uh, we've implemented a reduce function like we did before. We're using Scala Z monoid now, right? So before I said we had this addable with zero, that's really a monoid. And uh, anything that's in the Scala standard library, and perhaps maybe even the Java library, that makes, where it makes sense to have a monoid value for, Scala Z will provide for you. So I believe if I import that, that'll bring in the uh, type class instances for monoid of, say, int. So let me try reducing, uh, let's reduce, say, list. And I hope this works, and it's probably going to tell me to pick a class. Yes, of course. So instead of doing that. Yeah, OK. So Scala it provides its own uh, type class instances for types that make sense, right? So it's going to provide uh, monoids for <laughs> Uh, for int, double, string, uh, even lists, so we can try this. Uh, so import scala-z.monoid gives me the monoid type class, the type representing monoid. Importing the capital S scala-z will give me the actual type class instances. Here I'm gonna go ahead and reduce a list of lists, where the binary operation is going to be, of course, list concatenation, and the zero operation is going to be the empty list. And I, of course. If I go ahead and run that, yeah, uh, that works as well. And if you choose to have, if you want to make your own thing that is uh, that follows monoid loss, you just provide it in scope as you would for any other type class, and you can use any other Scala Z function that requires you to have a monoid on it. 
So now we have this pretty uh, generic function, right? We have a reduce that takes a list of A's so long as that A has a monoid instance. But we're not exactly really doing anything uh, specific to a list, right? We, we could just as easily uh, reduce down a, say, a vector of ints or a tree of ints, right? We, uh, because the monoid because monoid is associative, it doesn't really matter the order in which we do it. If I did fold left, fold right, it, I, we would have gotten the same result. So we, let's go one step further and abstract away the list. And so ideally at the end of this, we'd like to have something, a function, that can reduce a tree of ints or reduce a vector of, uh, a vector of lists. So I'm going to create something called a uh, type class called foldable, and this is where higher kinds come in. Uh, are people here familiar with higher kinds? Do I need to explain them? Would anyone like me to explain higher kinds? Perhaps would be a better question. Go ahead and explain higher kinds. So okay. So uh, are people familiar with higher order functions? Higher order functions, functions that take other functions and produce a value. So uh, the, the the short way of saying what I'm about to say for the next minute or so is going to be that types are to values what kinds are to types. And so let me pull up something so I can talk. This was me trying to be clever. Okay. Let's make this a bit bigger. So we're going to, I'm going to be using a notation called star. This should be read as a uh, type. So stuff that we're used to, concrete types, I guess, int, double, string, list of int, these all have kind star or kind type. Uh, stuff list by itself, right? So list takes a type parameter and gives, uh, takes a type parameter, gives you a concrete value. That has kind, uh, that has kind type to type. Right? So it takes a type and returns to you a type, just like how a regular function takes a value and returns to you a value. Uh, higher kind of types, which I'll show you, I guess, uh, in a bit, this will be the one I show you, are basically types that take type constructors and return to you a concrete type. So this has a kind, a kind type to type to type, meaning I can create a foldable of list. So list itself is, has a kind type to type Foldable can take something that has kind type to type and give to you back a concrete uh, type. That, like, does that make sense? Just to clarify the notation where you in after actually kind of doing the prototypical signature by like giving the signature to the list because actually it's a list on its own, not a product that has that kind, not list of A, list of A is just kind. Okay. Yeah, I did not know Adrian was here, who is the person who brought us higher kind of types. So now I'm going to just be nervous up here for the rest of this talk. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If Adrian corrects me, he's probably right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to make a type class foldable that takes a higher kind of type, and for my fold. For my foldable, uh, Scala says it's a bit different. I'm going to make a very relaxed version of foldable. Uh, it's going to have a type parameter A that's going to be a monoid. And this says if I have some foldable of A where A is a monoid, I can go ahead and fold or uh, reduce that down into a single A value, just like what we've been doing before. Then I can go ahead and give uh, instances for it. List has foldable equals new foldable of list. This will be a list of A. We'll reduce that down into an A. And I will go ahead and say delegate that to fold left. Oh, great. And I use, I'll use a verbose version. Oh, no. I have to. Do that weird thing again. Okay, so now I'm going to write a function. Let's call it fold, for lack of a better word. I need a function that takes in uh, something of type to type, so our container, I guess, and something of type A. Give me a container of A's where uh, the container is constrained by the fact that it must be foldable. 
and A is constrained by the fact that it must be a monoid. And here, what I'm gonna do is say f.fold on f of A, I believe. Let's see if that compiles. Okay, I need to label higher kinds, but I'm gonna ignore them. So yeah, so now I can, because I have a foldable instance in scope, a uh, foldable, uh, Foldable instance for list and scope, I can go ahead and fold over a, a list of ints. You know what, to make this be quiet, I'm just gonna go ahead and import it. Cool. Yeah, so now we're, we pulled out the, our function now has pulled out the fact that we're using a list. If you decide to create your own tree data structure, uh, you can think of how you would fold a tree of, say, ints down into a single int value, right? Because monoid doesn't really care in what order you do the append operation on it. Uh, you, can do, uh, you can do sum on depth first search, breadth first search, whatever you wanna do. Uh, any structure that really can be folded, tree and list are perhaps the more common ones. Let's see what else I have here. Yeah, okay. And let's look at the Scala Z equivalent of this. We can go ahead and pull in a foldable, pull in a monoid. And so now we have our foldable instances. All right, we can go ahead and look at the Scala doc for foldable, if I can spell it. Yeah, so where my foldable said you must implement this fold method that basically takes a container of A's and reduces it down to a single A, uh, you need to provide a bit, more, a bit uh, more, I guess, involved operations for Scala Z foldable. Fold map basically means if you have a container of A, if you can provide a function from A to B, where B is a monoid, uh, then it will go ahead and reduce that down to a single B value. And if you already have a container of A's, I guess you could do a fold map on identity, and that would work. Uh, and also requires you to do the fold write, which is the fold write perhaps that we're all used to in a uh, Scala collection list. And as long as you can implement those two methods, you get a whole slew of other methods at your disposal, one of which is fold, which is the thing I was showing, right? So by importing a uh, Scala Z foldable monoid, my function, the, the signature remains the same. Scala Z provides to you, right, this, this uh, fifth line import, the Scala Z provides to you foldable instances for list, vector, a lot of the standard library collection types, and I believe they also have their own Scala Z.tree. Might be foldable, but this should go ahead and compile. And yeah, so now we have, uh, We've now made our function fully generic and no longer depends that we have a list of ints. We first pulled out the fact that any two things that can be added and have a zero value. And then we pull out the fact that this is a list. So now I wanna show some other stuff uh, in Scala Z, that's pretty cool. Let's make a separate one. Let's call, I don't know, I'm lazy. Of course, I'm gonna have to make this two. What is it complaining about? Okay. So uh, one of the things that Scala Z provides is a type safe equals. I'm gonna go ahead and just bring in the entire world of Scala Z here. And so what type safe equals is, is if you've, if you've uh, been in Java land before, you know they have this equals method on object, which means it's not a compilation error if I go ahead and compare it into a string. It will generate a warning, but it compiles fine, and as you expect, the result is false. Uh, what Scala Z.equals does is it gives you, it, using type classes, it gives you a sort of type, uh, using type classes along with implicit conversions, it gives you a type safe equals. So this is a Scala Z REPL, where I brought in all of Scala Z. And now uh, the operator is triple equals. Now if I say five triple equals hello, it's going to say could not find implicit value for Scala Z equal object. 
what's happening is when you try to do five, compare five and uh, an int with a string, it's going to unify to a Java lang object. And since it doesn't really make sense to do equals on object, you don't provide a type class instance for equal object. Don't try to provide your instance for equal object. That would defeat the whole purpose. But uh, yeah, so now you have type safe equals. Uh, if you do five triple equals five, that works because you are able to compare two int, right? There is, there is an equal of int. Uh, another thing they provide is order. So in the Scala standard library, they do have, uh, I believe, there's Scala math ordering and there's Scala math uh, ordered. Ordered, I believe, is sort of the more uh, object-oriented approach where you have a class that extends ordered and then you say you can compare to a different thing. Uh, ordering is sort of the type class instance. Uh, is the type class version of ordered? Do you have a question? How does that type safe equal uh, works with uh, uh, two cases? One is five equal 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 5.0, and the other oh, okay. case where like, on the left there is a super class, on the right there is a subclass. Is there like, or vice versa? Uh, I think five, I think comparing a int to a float should fail, yeah. So this type type equals will not work with comparing two numeric types. Now you're saying on the left is a superclass, on the right is a subclass? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's try, do you have a superclass and subclass in mind or should I create my own? <laughs> okay, let me try, let's. Oh, I have to prov then I have to implement equals. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, yeah, true. Uh, I guess class foo. Excuse me? Oh, you want me to do case class? <laughs> case class. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, we can't subclass a case class. Or I believe it's a compiler warning if we try to subclass a case class. Yeah. Val x in. <laughs> uh, let's see what equals requires me to have equal. Oh, so I just need to do an equal. Okay, that's fine. Oh, wait. Uh, no. Val x equals. Oh, you just want to see if it compiles. In that case, I don't care. Bar x. I don't know. And then, no, I don't, I don't even think I need to contest this because uh, if we look at the type signature for equal, you can only compare, oh, I see. Yes, you should, it would compile, I think. Implicit, implicit foo is equal, implicit val foo is equal equals new f new equal of foo, if I can type, um, what is the operation? Equal of foo. Y of foo, it must return a Boolean. So I do val x equals new foo three. And then val y equals new. I don't even know why I put the double on the bar. Yeah, uh, it works, I guess. I hope that fails. Okay, apparently not. Yeah, I guess the types work out. Uh, yeah, as usual, be careful implementing equals when when dealing with subtyping. Uh, in my experience, I have yet to do to implement equals myself, but for the, the default ones they do give you on the Scala standard library, they, they will, I believe, I haven't, I haven't run into a case where I've had to use this type of equals with subtyping. But I think the power in equals, or maybe, yeah, power of equals is that you will not be able to compare two things that are completely separate types. You will not be able to compare an int and a string. It's a compile time error as opposed to uh, a runtime error which is always good. Uh, another thing they bring in is uh, order. So, sim so as I was saying, uh, Scala has sc Scala math order and Scala math ordering. There's also a Scala Z order, where order 
is going to have this. This ordering returned isn't the Scala math ordering. It's a different Scala Z ordering, which I'll show you right now. Uh, there's a, so, so here's where we get into Scala Z's sort of uh, symbolic operator notation. Uh, so there's question mark, pipe question mark. I can do five colon, pipe colon six. And so Scala Z ordering is sort of this, I believe it's an algebraic data type that represents uh, less than, equal than, and greater than. And if you implement order, uh, you get a bunch of the stuff that you would expect with uh, anything that has an order on it. So it's, I believe, an alternative to Scala math ordering. Uh, I know Scooby uses order as opposed to ordering along with a few other of the type level guys prefer, prefer order. Does anyone here know uh, the difference between Scala Z order and Scala math ordering? Is there a difference? Okay, so I'm going to assume that they are equivalent in functionality. Uh, another thing that Scala Z provides is enum, which is uh, basically anything that can be enumerated. For instance, in Scala, we're able to write uh, one to 10, right? And it's gonna generate a range from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, because you can enumerate over an int. Uh, let me see, can we do C to A? Oh, we can't. We have to do A to C. Okay, so that works. Uh, Scala Z provides its own enum, so, and along, along with the enum, it provides some, uh, some other methods. So yeah, you have to satisfy order, uh, predecessor, and successor. Of course, if you implement, so trait enum extends order, it's worth noting that if you're able to provide an enum instance, then by definition, let's say you have an enum of uh, say Java util calendar, then you are, by definition, you then also have an order of, cal of Java util calendar. So any function that's just expecting a, uh, an ordering on the, on the elements, so long as you have an enum type, if you have an enum type class instance for that type, then you can go ahead and call that function because in order to implement enum, you must of course have an ordering. Uh, one of the operators that Scala Z provides on enum is uh, this weird, so you can just as you, so, there is five to 10. That's also, in fact, let's see. I believe Scala Z enum, Scala Z provides its own implicit conversion, so you have a two method on something that's enumerable. Two. Okay, these are not helpful names. Okay, so Scala Z provides uh, some log operators to, to, to define your own uh, enumeration. So I can just as easily do five to 10. I can replace the dash with an equals and that returns to me a stream. So if you have, if you have like a range that's extremely large and you don't want to persist it in memory, it'll return to you a Scala Z ephemeral stream. The difference between a Scala Z ephemeral stream and a regular Scala collection stream is that I believe uh, as you evaluate the first few parts of a Scala collection stream, those parts remain in memory. Is that correct, Adrian? Yeah, those parts will remain in memory, whereas I believe Scala Z ephemeral stream, uh, once you evaluate the first part and don't do anything else with it, that, gets, that is no longer available to you. So with enum, we can define our own. Uh, so since enum is a type class, we can go ahead and define our own uh, instances for enum for our own types. So let's say uh, I'm gonna do something silly here. But I'm gonna go ahead and say int wrapper. It's just going to wrap an int. And then I'm gonna say implicit val int wrapper has enum. And that equals a new instance of enum for int wrapper. What are the operations I need to define on it? I need an order. It needs to take an int wrapper, another int wrapper, return to me a ordering, go ahead and annotate explicitly. I'm gonna cheat and just do x dot x, y dot x delegate to the underlying integer. It needs a predecessor, so pred of a int wrapper will be simply an int wrapper of 
uh, let's cheat, let's delegate it to the x's. Implicitly now I'm pred of x dot x. And we can do the same thing with successor. Enum of int dot uh, successor. And I hope this compiles. 